Hello, welcome to this uh, round session discussion on adipose tissue morphology and uh, metabolism. We're going also to discuss processes related to uh, inflammation. And for this discussion uh, today, I'm joined by uh, Dr. André Chernoff, as well as Dr. André Maret, both colleagues here at Université Laval in, in Quebec City, uh, Canada. So gentlemen, thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, André, I'll start uh, with you first. You have developed a unique clinical research program where you have access actually to something quite precious, this amantal fat that all of us are interested in. Could you describe for us your, your research program? Yes. Well, it's, it's quite difficult to study uh, human visceral fat because one needs to access the abdominal cavity through a general uh, surgery under general anesthesia. Uh, so, uh, in the past uh, several years, we teamed up with uh, a number of surgeons at uh, hospitals affiliated with Laval University to have access to the list of patients who undergo elective uh, surgeries of various types and recruit them, uh, consent them, so that they would participate in our studies and we would sample a small amount of fat from inside the abdominal cavity and they would take uh, a sample of subcutaneous fat at the same time so we get a perfect uh, design to compare the biological nature of those two uh, fat compartments and at the same time in some of those populations we were able to add uh, some clinical tests to characterize those populations quite well, so it's been useful. Yeah, I, I guess one very interesting aspect of this program is the very extensive cardiometabolic profiling that you have on top of having access to uh, measurements of uh, uh, mental fat uh, morphology metabolism. So what are your, your key, I would say, primary findings? Well, we've, uh, we've uh, examined visceral fat in a number of ways. We've examined uh, the first uh, key element would be cellularity, I think. Adipocyte size is a critical determinant of adipocyte function. So the bigger the adipocytes or the smaller the adipocyte the functions will be affected uh, according to the size of the cells. So uh, we've, uh, uh, with the years, you know, we've collected so many samples that we've been able to get a, uh, an overall picture of the size of the adipocytes in various compartments according to BMI levels. So uh, we found that, for example, uh, adipocytes in women are uh, almost uh, um, always larger in the subcutaneous fat mm -hmm. than in the visceral fat. So visceral fat adipocytes are smaller in women mm -hmm. at every adiposity level, whereas this difference is completely non-existent in men. So even at low BMI levels, uh, mental fat cells are as big as the subcutaneous fat cells. So and this is not trivial, right? This has consequences. It, so we males are more prone to visceral exactly, fat cell hypertrophy exactly. and it has consequences. Yes. The, the hypertrophy of the adipocytes, particularly in the mental fat compartment, and we've shown this very recently uh, in a paper uh, that's going to come out soon, that uh, Omental fat cell hypertrophy is a strong predictor of hypertriglyceridemia in the fasting state. Uh, and this is independent of the adiposity of the person. Uh, it's a distribution uh, of adipose tissue measured by computer tomography, age, and every adiposity parameter that we could think of. So mm -hmm. it seems that omental fat cell hypertrophy per se is a very strong marker of cardiometabolic risk. So what do you think uh, from your studies are, are the mediator of that that relationship, because as you know, this portal free fatty acid the theory is, is quite controversial. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a yes. causal relationship between this uh, mental fat cell hypertrophy, hyperlipolytic state, and complication, or is it an epiphenomenon? It, it, it's still a, quite a complex question, and, and there's experimental ev evidence for uh, either uh, sides at this time. It could be a uh, part, uh, visceral fat could partly cause some of the complications of the metabolic syndrome or cardiometabolic risk, or it could be just a marker of a dysfunction of adipose mm -hmm. tissue in general, mm -hmm. and we're still debating between those two issues. Correct. And there, there are evidence to support each side of the story. And, and André, on, on your side, you have some old data, some uh, very nice old studies that have shown some unique uh, characteristics of uh, those are mental fat cells, right, in terms of uh, response to insulin and so on? Yeah, that's actually work we carried out together many years ago that's where right. we, we showed that these mental cells uh, are clearly insulin resistant, 
the ability of insulin to stimulate glucose uptake in these cells is clearly decreased, and also the antilipolytic effect of insulin, which is also very important, uh, metabolic effect of insulin is reduced as well in these cells. So clearly, uh, the metabolic profile of these cells is uh, really problematic, I would say. So there's, there are really uh, some unique characteristics of, of those fat cells. I guess the, the future, it'll be interesting in the future to see what kind of additional evidence uh, uh, becomes available. You certainly has a, a, a very rich program to, to address uh, this issue. And um, I would say a related topic is this, this issue of menopause. And because you have uh, so much data in, in women, yes. this question comes out all the time, you know, this accumulation of abdominal visceral fat with, with age, a contribution of age, menopause. Yes, what, what is your uh, uh, opinion are, on this th issue? There are a number of methodological issues in studying the menopause, and one obviously is the change in age as women go through the menopause. And when you want to compare postmenopausal women to premenopausal women, there's an age gap that you can't That's right. get rid of experimentally. So this is very difficult to study. There's been a, a, a large number of studies comparing pre- and postmenopausal women, and they've been all to some degree confounded by age differences. So it's very difficult to see uh, what goes on in there. So uh, the more uh, solid studies would be the longitudinal studies, which followed women through the transition and that examined those who changed their status in a longitudinal design. And there's a, a beautiful study by Jennifer Lovejoy that was out a couple of years ago that showed that menopause is associated with slight gain in visceral fat. Mm -hmm. And this seems specific uh, to the visceral fat compartment. Mm -hmm. So all women who were followed uh, through the longitudinal follow-up gained total body fat mass and subcutaneous fat mass, but only those who went through the menopause uh, gained visceral fat. Now, mind you, this was a small increase, so it's fairly, uh, it was significant, but it was a fairly small increase, so I think it, uh, it could be prevented by changing lifestyle, mm -hmm. possibly, uh, and I'm saying this because in that same study, uh, physical activity levels seem to decrease prior mm -hmm. to the menopause. So this seems to be a, a very critical period for women in terms of uh, changing lifestyle habits and as well uh, metabolic parameters. And, and if I may add, you know, this old debate about the added value of measuring waist circumference on, on top of BMI, this is definitely a group where measuring yes. waist circumference in women passing through menopause and depositing uh, a visceral fat selectively where it could be uh, mm -hmm. uh, very uh, helpful. Yes. Now, Andre, um, on your side, uh, you are conducting a very large uh, research program exploring the drivers of cardiovascular disease uh, risk in patient with type 2 diabetes. Could you uh, describe this large program for us? Yeah, it is a, a very large program that encompassed uh, core groups working on both the molecular aspects of diabetes complications, but also uh, genetic aspects, as well as a core that is investigating the clinical aspects. And this, uh, this great project is done in collaboration with, uh, in, in Finland with some researchers in Finland at Kyoko University. And uh, we have carried out this uh, research for the last three years, and we have generated recently very interesting results, both looking at animal models of diabetes, uh, suffering from cardiovascular disease, obviously, but also at the genetic level and at the clinical level. So, for example, at the level of the animal models, we generated a novel model of atherosclerosis, combining also obesity uh, and diabetes and atherosclerosis, and in this model, we find uh, extremely increased level of inflammatory markers. So mm -hmm. the level of inflammation in these animals is very important. This is interesting because our genetic core, uh, through a genome-wide association study, mm -hmm. has also found that there are some mutations and some very key inflammatory genes that seems to be linked with the complication of abdominal obesity. And uh, also very interestingly, our clinical work, which has been done here at Laval Hospital and also in Finland, I've shown that uh, modification of lifestyle uh, involving both uh, nutritional changes and exercise was able to reduce the body weight uh, in uh, individuals with patients with, cardio, uh, with cardiovascular risk factors which under, underwent uh, cardiac surgery. And in these patients as well, we've seen a reduction in inflammation 
improvement of insulin sensitivity. So even, we've previously shown this in, in obese individuals, but even a patient which underwent cardiac surgery have clearly benefited from this uh, lifestyle modification. Yes, I've seen those preliminary results uh, myself as well, and I must say this is a pleasant surprise to see that what uh, was found in viscerally obese males, asymptomatic but at high risk, was confirmed in patients with documented exactly. uh, coronary heart disease and with, uh, with type 2 diabetes. Now, from this research program, I think we're getting more and more robust evidence now that inflammation is clearly a key mediator of the relationship between putting on fat at, at the wrong place and risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Now, in addition to this uh, multidisciplinary research program, you have a huge research program looking at molecular uh, aspects of, of inflammation related to obesity, diabetes, and, and cardiovascular disease. And for the primary care physicians now, what, what are your key, I would say, potentially interesting targets? Well, I think the, uh, the recent discoveries in that field have shown two very important features. First of all, we know that the inflammation takes origin in the adipose tissue, particularly in the visceral adipose tissue, of course, and there seems to be an attraction for a macrophage within the adipose tissue. We know that with obesity developing in the visceral abdominal area, macrophage coming from the bone marrow are attracted to the tissue. It creates a very inflammatory environment. And what we also know now, it's not only macrophages that are there, but even T cells and neutrophils, so very typical immune cells, are really uh, infiltrating the adipose tissue of obese individuals, and they are creating this inflammation, which is key to drive insulin resistance, because if you can prevent it through different maneuvers, uh, at the animal level at least, you can really prevent insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. So there's a clear link between inflammation uh, and insulin resistance. And the second thing which is quite interesting is that everybody is wondering what, what is triggering, what is the triggering primary event mm -hmm. that leads to inflammation in fat. And what uh, we have recently realized and, and published is that you can, for example, only increase the level of free fatty acids in a given animal model, which is lean, not obese, mm -hmm. and you can trigger a very important inflammatory response, with, not only within the adipose tissue, but also in muscle and liver. So uh, nutrient stress, overnutrition itself, appears to be able to trigger inflammation. And we think that this is the link between overnutrition and inflammation leading to obesity link complications. So that's very interesting. And actually, would you link that, or could it be a possibility then again that the ability of subcutaneous fat to act as a metabolic sink could protect against exposure of excess free fatty acid in other uh, tissues. Do you think this is a, a possible scenario? Absolutely, and this is probably behind the mechanism by which TZDs, p -par gamma mm -hmm. agonists, are able to prevent some of the inflammation. If you can use subcutaneous fat as a sink to actually uh, uh, try to reduce the uh, increase in the free fatty acids in the circulation, and therefore reduce the amount mm -hmm. of so of fat in the uh, visceral abdominal area, you will clearly decrease the triggering of inflammation and therefore improve insulin sensitivity. Now, both of you are very busy. You have very uh, active and, and productive research program. There's, there's another hat that you wear, your interest from, for nutritional factors, which could potentially uh, modulate, actually, adipose tissue physiology and processes uh, uh, modulating inflammation. Could you describe for us briefly uh, what are your interests there? Yeah, our most recent uh, discovery, which was published in Diabetes, have shown that not all lipids are the same. Uh, of course, uh, saturated fat, omega-6, unsaturated fat can trigger inflammation. However, if you favor omega-3 fatty acids, uh, if you can find a way to increase the omega-3 content in the cells, you will reduce inflammation. And you will reduce inflammation not only in the adipose tissue, but also in the liver. And we believe this is occurring because Omega-3 fatty acids are a substrate for a very important nexus of molecules that have been recently discovered called the protectins and the resolvins. And when you have a higher concentrations of omega-3 fatty acids, therefore reducing the importance of the omega-6 component, you will generate much more of these molecules, these resolvins and protectins, and as their name suggests, they can resolve or protect against inflammation. 
And in an animal model, when you actually increase the amount of omega-3 fatty acids, when you actually increase the amount of these molecules that are derived from those omega-3 fatty acids, you can get obesity, but you will not get inflammation, and therefore the insulin sensitivity of these animals is markedly increased, markedly improved, despite the presence of obesity. So they seem to be able to uncouple, the omega-3 are able to uncouple obesity from insulin resistance. That's, that's very uh, important because it puts uh, back the emphasis on the quality of uh, the diet in addition to the quantity. So from a, a, pri a, a pragmatic standpoint, your recommendation would be what, omega-3 supplements for the time being, or fish, or uh, what, would be a, what would be simple ways to make sure that you have a decent uh, intake of omega-3 uh, fatty acids? Well, clearly a greater uh, increase in the uh, proportion of fish in the diet would do it. Uh, of course, taking omega-3 supplements is not a bad idea. We know they are decreasing inflammation, improving the lipid profile. But again, if, uh, if, if this is not achieved uh, also by lowering the amount of omega-6 in the diet, this is like a drop in the ocean. You really need to take more omega-3 fatty acids, but also to reduce the amount of omega-6. Of course, not too much, because omega-6 fatty acids are also essential. So you need those. But I think right now, in, in, in North America and throughout the world, the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 is too much favoring omega-6, close mm -hmm. to 30 to 50 to 1 in some population. And I think we should get down to maybe 15 to 1 uh, at the most. So I think this is, but clearly one way to do it is to eat more and more fish. Mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen, that was a very uh, interesting uh, discussion. We have discussed adipose tissue, a quality, quality of the diet. I think inflammation is really at the forefront of this whole issue, uh, linking uh, uh, visceral obesity, ectopic fat deposition, risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease. We are going to certainly revisit this issue in, uh, in years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.